Here we have an important material in the northern forests. Basically, we have cattail, birch, and willow as our major source of raw materials for crafting almost everything that we need to sustain ourselves in the northern forests. Here we have an example of Bebb's willow that is perhaps about 10 or 15 years old and it is free of knots and, and branches for a considerable part of it and we were going to strip the bark off to show how it's made into net. We may start at the bottom with a tool like a crack rock or a knife and we begin to cut across to be able to peel some of the bark off so we can peel up up we're cutting across right down to the woods so that we can get uh, uh, a little bit of bark free to grasp it we get them together and we start to pull this only happens at a certain time of the year probably starting about the uh, last week or so in May, depending on dryness or weather conditions, and ending probably somewhere towards middle August. Again, if it rains a lot, this persists longer. If it doesn't rain very much, the bark may adhere um, a lot sooner. Now the time of year with which you peel the bark off is quite critical. If it happens that your bark peels off and then turns a dark brownish red, then you have hit the exact time, uh, the time, perfect time to make a cordage material that stays flexible at um, all times. If the redness does not appear, soaking in water sometimes will bring it on. But if it stays white regardless, then your cord will dry, your fiber will dry stiff and uh, will require gentle handling when it's dry because if it's flexed too much when it's dry, it will just simply break. We have scraped off enough uh, in the area to uh, make our point with regard to how cord is made from this inner bark. Now we have finished the the separation of the cruddy bark from the fibrous material. Now we make a cut and try to take off as wide a strip. In some cases, if we are making pack straps, for example, we might want to make a very wide strip. Uh, in being able to peel the bark off really easily and quickly, you try to use pieces that are as wide as possible. And the wider they are, the higher they go up on the tree. We have now left with a raw material that could be folded up and put away and used at your leisure at any time of the year. Uh, if it turns brown, then you'll find you can unravel it without soaking. If it stays white, you'll have to keep it soaked while you're working it. The bark can be folded up into a neat bundle and become part of a so-called kit for future use. As in many cases, you have to gather your materials when they are gatherable and use them when you have the time to or the leisure to make cordage and so on. The native people filled their uh, their long winters with such things as keeping up on their fiber. This is the only material that was used for the making of net in the Northwest Territories because stinging nettle was not available and this fiber was shredded to the point where you could make netting string out of it. It's not strong enough perhaps to use as fish line, but it's strong enough to be made into net. In the making of uh, fine string, as we would here out of willow bast fiber, for the making of string suitable for nets, we like to shred it fine enough that it will roll fairly well under the, the palm of the hand, usually the bare skin. So once it's shredded enough to roll, then that's fine enough. The pieces should be of random length um, so that they never end up at the same uh, spot as you're adding more to make a continuous fiber. We have 
a few here to make our point. The situation is that you want material to roll. I'll put it handy. Here we have a good starter piece. So we fold it so that the ends are staggered a little bit right off the bat. Roll them up a little. Then we roll them parallel to each other. And when we let go of the end, we gain three or four centimeters of, of string. Uh, you've got to have them both pretty well roll equally for the string to be at its best. And you find that bare skin will grip much better than normal. You can keep going. And when we start getting to the end of one of the fibers, then we parallel one beside it with the shorter one and we join on. And we have here at least one roll between joints. And this is getting to the point where we better add another. And you'll notice that if you pick on your fibers in the way that they are tapered, then you'll get a smooth transition from one to the other. The ends that are left after you've joined can be snipped off later. And we have to keep the fibers separated down below and have them wind around each other. There are many ways of spinning. This is the quickest that you can make string, but you probably might not apply this to bow strings. Here we have a, a lump that we could have um, eliminated earlier. We'll have to make an addition because we excluded the lump. It would have been a unsightly point of addition. And of course, the more you do this, the neater your string and the faster the process. When the cord gets uh, pretty thick, then uh, you'll find that rolling on the thigh becomes uh, too difficult. So here we have a, a cord that might be thick enough to use with a bow drill. We're twisting it, then we put it side by side and we see a kink form. Well, we can grasp that kink and then we can twist each time and transfer our hands. And we can't see what we're doing. We do it by rote. And our fingers will tell us what's happening with regard to the thicknesses of the strands. One of these is starting to get thinner. So we take and we add. And we keep twisting until the next strand communicates to us by the feel of the fingers that it's getting thinner. And you take at least three twists between additions to make sure you don't create a weak spot. If both strands are uh, um, getting thin at the same time. You can add a little to each side or you can distribute your, if some strand is for some reason getting thicker than it should be, you can rob some of it to the opposite side. So there are many alternatives available in order to be able to maintain a suitable thickness. Here both are getting thinner and so we add equally to both sides. The, uh, Twisting here doesn't require any other aids except the teeth. And usually when you're making bow drill cords, they're probably nose to fingertip long snare cords. You might choose to use your mouth uh, holding the opposite ends. End. When making heavier cord, bow drill cord or lash cord or whatever heavier rope you're into, you often work by attaching to an object like a a branch or a tree, or more conveniently, you drive a stick in the ground in front of where you plan to work. In some cases, you may choose to split the stick and use the split as a means to anchor the cord. And then you take your, your desired thicknesses that you determine from trial and error what you want. And you may either twist a small amount and lodge it in the, in the crack. I prefer that method because I can wrap around the stick as I back away. Uh, and we make a little bit of, of, of twine and we jam it in there. We uh, sometimes have to pry that open with our knife to get our cord in, but once it grips, and away we go. The, uh, the stick should be about waist high. 
And here we're twisting both strands up fairly tightly and then switching hands. We work pretty close to our, our uh, twisting area and we give an equal twist to both strands at the same time and again the fingers will signal to us what's happening to the thicknesses of the strands. If they're getting thinner or thicker we also can see that we're getting short here and in this instance we will add the fiber. The fibers that we add they may be added the end if it's especially if it's taper added to the opposite side and that in this uh, situation uh, saves the trimming later of the fuzzy nature of the ends that stick out. The um, strand here now is thinning on one side so I'm using a long piece and adding equally to each strand. Generally three twists between additions. My fingers are telling that one of the strands here is still thinning down and we appear to give ourselves a, a circumstance where we will twist for quite a while before we have to add any more. This I purposely left to show that this is what you trim off later. Now as the work comes towards you, if you happen to be seated on something solid, you now can keep from working towards you by uh, wrapping around your stick. Now my additions here have resulted in one of the strands, strands being kind of thick and we will steal some of it from the one to the other and now everything is equal in hunkadori. As we progress we may choose to make a three-stranded cord. At this point we will demonstrate the process. We, when we want to quit we go as if to tie a knot and if we plan to continue on our work we make it into a slip knot. If we are finishing we uh, remove that from the slip. Here we have the circumstance that we have a bit of the cord and we want to add a third strand to make it a three-stranded rope. Here we have something that's a little massive so we'll reduce it down. These pieces need not be more than, than a third of a meter long, sometimes even less, hand span long and they are workable. You can make uh, a pretty good rope with fibers that are probably no longer than that but if they are longer the work goes along uh, faster. Here I have a thickness that I'm developing that will be the same as one of the strands in the rope and when I've got enough I might choose one of many ways to anchor that perhaps just simply here and we put this back into the into the uh, split stick which is very effective in its springiness so we have to open it a little bit with our knife to cram everything in. Here in order to make our, our cord we twist the third cord the same amount as the others and open the, the one that we have already made, the two-stranded cord and we probably increase the diameter a little but we probably double the strength of the cord or more by making it more round and giving that additional piece of fiber and that's how you make a three-stranded cord. Highly recommended in the case of making the cords for bow drilling purposes. A cord of this nature could be a little thinner than it is but probably will suffice to rotate the spindle on a bow and drill. And when we catch up we can set this aside and then work with the other two. Since we have two hands we have to uh, divide the work up. Uh, after we have taken the cord off here we may roll it on a flat surface to give it uh, a more even texture and it'll look as if it's machine made. But this is basically the standard methods of making uh, cord, in this particular case the inner bark of willow, Bebb's willow, which is uh, highly uh, used in, in the far north where stinging nettle is not available.